Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the French Connections Friday Night Edition. Today's date is August 24th of 2007. It's actually on the cusp of being August 25th, ladies and gentlemen. We're four minutes to midnight here in, in central France. And we have put together an article with the help of and the, uh, and the research of uh, Mohamed Rafik. Mohamed has been uh, a, a frequent guest on the French Connection, so many of you are well aware of Mohamed's work. Uh, there are people uh, that have tried to assail our efforts in many areas that Mohammed has talked about. But his confirmations uh, generally come from uh, from very reliable sources, uh, very d different sources. In fact, he uses archives, he uses Internet, he uses um, historical documents, he uses all kinds of different sourcing uh, to verify the things that he uh, presents. And that there is no exception to tonight's presentation on um, the foundations of um, the Young Turk movement and how it was orchestrated through a uh, the Italian lodge structure, Masonic lodges, that, which were infiltrated um, in the century prior to the Turkish um, Young Turk Revolution in, in, in the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, downfall, and how these uh, these these lodges were used as instruments to undermine the control of uh, of the, the Turkish government of the uh, Ottoman uh, Turk government and institute a new government under Ataturk. Now, I'm going to bring up my um, my guest in one moment, but I want to make um, a statement about uh, Daniel Abramson's uh, presentation. Um, you will find that uh, it is a, a very well-orchestrated uh, presentation. It is, uh, in almost every way, um, mirrors the work we uh, put out on our audio files and in our written work and Bolin's work and others that we've had on the French Connection for about two years now. Uh, he does a very complete job of presenting it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, you might want to ask yourself uh, um, who had it first, and, and not this isn't a, a, a one-upsman game here, but rather that where were um, the, the Jack Bloods of the world who actually were at this conference where he did this presentation, uh, when they were bad-mouthing us for our efforts uh, exposing the Zionist criminals. They were telling everybody that we were no good, we were liars, and now all of a sudden they've come to see the light. Well, what we've come to understand is that the real game they're trying to play here is take control of the message. And uh, we'll go into that on another file, but I just wanted to point it out that they are attempting again to take control of the message. This is no different than what uh, Mr. Berkness has done. Um, he did early files with us, and now he's claiming that the research we've got is uh, is from his research, which certainly it is not. And we have actually found things out that he will not touch, has not discussed. And again, he's trying to carry the message to the Armenian community so that the criminals themselves are presenting the work rather than the the uh, actual researchers. But I'm going to bring up my guest right now. Uh, Mohammed, are you with me? I am indeed. Good evening, Daryl. Nice to have you back, Mohammed. You know, uh, as always, we are we're just we're trying to move the ball down the field. And you made a, a, an, um, an interesting observation that uh, the French connection has always been uh, out at the head of the tip of the spear, as it were, with uh, with our research and the things that we've discovered. <clears throat> and and it's oftentimes the people that are doing their own uh, uh, catch up are are actually the bad guys trying to usurp our. Uh, position in leadership here as researchers. Um, so they've got a three-pronged approach to trying to destroy the French connection. First, uh, assail our character and us personally, and then usurp our our uh, leadership as uh, researchers, and then finally um, to ignore us. And those are the three ways that they have uh, tried to get rid of our message. Uh, I don't think it's working. What do you think? Well, I think that um, from the figures which you're quoting, Daryl, it seems like more and more people are tuning in to your shows and more and more people are looking at the uh, pages which you're putting on your site and, and the whole thing is growing. So it is. On, that, on that basis alone, factually, they're, they're failing. Yeah, I agree. And well, what, what we've got with your, your present presentation here on this, uh, on this Young Turk movement you want to get us started on, on a couple of the, the points? In fact, it, there's going to be 
the accompaniment accompanying um, article that you wrote on the uh, on the file with this. But I'd like to discuss some of the the uh, nuances of your research. We, we want to start us off with this movement and possibly how it got its uh, its beginnings. Sure. I mean, we had a, a bit of a discussion the other day, didn't we, Daryl, on, on yeah. this subject where we touched it a bit. And I felt a little bit guilty at the end of it about not really filling in details and giving um, the listeners to your show uh, hard and fast researchable facts, which is what we're used to giving people. So um, I, I went out and put something together from the books which I normally have that I would use as my sources, and I've looked to see what kind of information was available on the internet so that it's there for referral purposes because as you said in the previous show maybe for somebody listening to this for the first time it's it's too fantastic it's just oh th 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 this can't possibly be the case mm. so what we're, what we're trying to do the, 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 to just to set the background for everybody i'm, I'm trying to use um, authorized orthodox historians and biographers who talk very coldly, and, and as you've, you've read the piece already, Daryl, I'm yeah. also quoting people like the British ambassador to Constantinople, the U.S. ambassador, and, and other similar kinds of figures from, from uh, declassified and publicly available uh, government documents. And, and of course, uh, Mr. Gray himself, the, 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 the foreign secretary at the time, uh, in the Foreign Office of the British Government. So, f f very well-known people. The reason for that is that the people like the ADL at the moment who are trying to not recognize the genocide as, as one of uh, history's many rewrites, there's a group of people out there on the net who are publishing their version of history Mm -hmm. which has got some of the, the, the important facts. They admit quite a few elements, and then they try and take people off down the garden path this way or that way to try and put, make, make it look like the, the real uh, protagonists were somebody else. That's you right. Know? So this is, this is the, the, the nature of the activity, because what we've been trying to do, the work that you've been doing, that I've been trying to support you with, is to show people that it's the same group that have marched down the centuries that have been up to this. Yeah. And so what they have to do is make it look like it's been different groups throughout the centuries in, involved in these activities. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this allegation is unfounded. That's right. Well, I, I, the interesting thing that, that I've discovered that, that in, from your research as well as and, and I have to admit some of the research from other people who are trying to marginalize us as leaders in this uh, fight uh, do point out that, uh, that Sabatai C has a very important role to play in the relationship that the Ottoman Turks had uh, with the uh, young Turks and, and how the uh, crypto-Jewish um, uh, movement within the, uh, the caliph's um, uh, Ottoman, you know, empire began to grow. Now, what you point out in the piece is that there were um, there was friction between the Armenian community that was being uh, actually fomented and, and exacerbated by the British, American, and other governments, German governments. Uh, in order, was it German? You said I can't remember the in, inside the piece, but there were people, there were groups out there trying to have the Armenians rise up a little bit uh, for independence or more recognition within the Ottoman Empire, and the, this. Um, kind of led the, the caliph, I would imagine, to suspect them, which was his downfall, because the people that were telling them to suspect the, uh, the uh, Armenians for this were actually the ones that ultimately took him over. I think that the, the side scraps that were going on with the Armenians and the, uh, the caliph uh, weren't major issues. They were internal domestics. They were seen by the British and the Germans and the Russians as an attempt to make friends in the area with par parties that were hostile to the leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was purely for international political purposes um, that they all saw that in the event that um, changes would happen in the government or that they the Armenians succeeded in getting devolution to some degree and autonomy, that they would have been allies at that stage and would have had influence in the area. And right. of course the Armenians were sat 
on the Baku oil fields at that time. Yep. Uh, so th th there were political reasons there. Um, and, and what we have going in the opposite direction, as I point out in the piece, are, are this young Turk movement who want to actually divest everybody of, divest the, the Sultanate of the other Muslim lands and just focus on those which are Turkic. Mm -hmm. But but they included Armenia as Turkic lands, right. and they wanted a, a national identity that would be um, totally irrespective of faith or belief, and it was completely Turk based. and And that is something which Lalfa, the um, the British ambassador to Turkey himself, uh, observed and sent back to the Foreign Office as the, the, the view of the Young Turk movement. Well, it, it, you, you pointed out something just a, a couple of statements ago about having them try to blame several other disparate groups for the things that they're doing. And one at that time was uh, was the British Crown, um, and and you'll notice that that in in the modern day the British Crown is is not uh, uh, resisting the work the wor inner workings of this group. But at the at the time of this writing, were were the British um, government was the British government and the Crown of Britain behind the activities uh, of, of the Young Turk movement. Well, this is um, an example of the kind of false trails which are put out there. Um, there is an article which appeared in Executive Intelligence Review in 2005. They've also put it up on their net, on their web page, on their websites, which is helpful. Um, and and the, in that, they try to give the idea that the British government or the British establishment um, were the, the true secret forces behind the Young Turk Revolution. And what they do is they go to a pivotal character, um, who I, I mentioned in the piece, and I, uh, his name was Carasso. He was a Sephardic Jew um, from Salonika, a lawyer by training, and he somehow became all of a sudden the Grand Master of one of the lodges in Salonika. And from there basically became the safe haven for the Young Turk movement. And that through various political reasons, it became, it, they, the lodges were classed as houses of foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. And um, a system had come into place, which uh, were known as the capitulations, which meant that houses of foreign nationals in the lands of the caliph were exempt from police searches and so on. So the young Turks were able to operate inside these lodges um, uh, with, un, under diplomatic immunity, you see. Mm -hmm. And what they say in their piece, and, and, and Caruso and these lodges are, are critical, they don't deny Caruso. They don't deny the lodges. They don't deny any of that. What they say is that, but... Carasso was an agent of Lord Palmerston. Mm. And as an agent of Lord Palmerston, everything that, that, that he did was for Lord Palmerston and Lord Palmerston's agenda. Okay. You see? So now, that, now what, what, what ties did Palmerston have uh, to any Zionist? There was none that you could, uh, you could, you could suss out, were, were there? No, Palmerston was, was not Zionist at all, mm -hmm. and, and it, 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 it's, it's a nonsense, really, uh, to try and link this man Carasso. It, it, there's no way, you see, something that's very important in all of this, when we look for things that don't add up, there's a very simple one. Uh, Carasso was the Grand Master of a Lodge. We have to ask the question, how do you get a job like that? Yep. You know, how do you become in charge of a Freemasonic Lodge? Uh, and, and then we get into this really complicated world, which I've avoided in, in the document, uh, because it, it is so complex, of all the different types of lodges that are around, United Grand Lodge of England, the Orient, the US, York Rites, Scottish Rites, the different types of rites that are practiced in them. And th this is an extremely complex area. But one thing we can be sure of is that the Grand Master of a Lodge can only be appointed by someone who is above him. And coming above that particular lodge, Carasso's lodge, which was seen as an Italian lodge, would take us to the Grand Orient Lodge of Italy. Right. And the, 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 the head chief at that lodge, the Grand Master at that lodge, 
is the only man in the whole world that can give anybody the job of being Grand Master at the uh, lodge in which Carasso was organizing act his activities in Salonica. Now, who was the Grand Master at the time of Carasso's um, um, ascension to the... Um to the Grand, the Grand Lodge in in uh, in Istanbul. In, in Salonika. In, in Salonika, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah it was the Resort Lodge in Salonika, number 80. And the other thing that I've ex uh, I've given the online reference for as well is that Ataturk, uh, who became leader of Turkey, was also a Freemason and a member of the same lodge. And uh, and just by coincidence, these two gentlemen were both from the same faith, were they not? They were both Don May. Absolutely. They were both, and, and the Don May were um, pseudo Jewish uh, Sab uh, Sabbatian followers, were they not? That, well, that's exactly what they are. They're, 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 they're crypto Jewish, uh, out, outwardly Muslim, um, in, inwardly Jew. Um, what, I don't know what, how you can really. I mean, it, it's, it baffles me what they must think as individuals what, what what their personal identity is because it confuses me just thinking about it externally well at and some point in the future uh, Muhammad I'd like to discuss what what being a Sab uh, a Sabbatian is and uh, and and when we go through the the idea of uh, being a bohemian and everybody thinks that that's just being a fun loving person we're going to give them a, another eye opener at some point we've discussed this before but I, I would like people to understand that uh, Orthodox Judaism, as practiced by Nutura Carta, uh, is certainly not sab Sabbatian in any way, and that um, that in fact it, it's diametric in its uh, in its in its activities. Um, but let's get back to this this young Turk thing. Now that lodge, who who ran the Aryan Lodge uh, of Italy at the time of Carasso's um, ascension to his Salonica position? Well, um, we, when we look into the the actual <coughs> formation of the Grand Orient Italy Lodge, it is an amazing fact, uh, but you yourself have seen it, uh, the historical evidence for it, um, it was actually uh, created by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte himself yep. at the time that he brought um, Italy to its knees and, and effectively became King of Italy. And um, as part of his process of taking over, he, they put various new institutions in place, one of which was um, the, the Grand Orient of Italy. This means that the charter, because each lodge is started by a charter, if um, we wanted to start um, a new lodge in France, you would apply to the Grand Orient of France for um, permission to have a charter. And they would then grant a charter and you would be able to operate under that grand lodge. So all minor lodges, small lodges are under a grand lodge. Uh, well now, <laughs> now since the grand, it, it, the, uh, the grand lodge in Italy was a, um, it was, it was a, a, a formed lodge through uh, Napoleon, that would, and Napoleon at the time of that founding was emperor of France. It would probably uh, in, be in keeping with his position as the Grand Master of the Orient Lodge of Paris, or someone of, of that level of, of um, uh, uh, position, in my, in, in my guessing. The, gra the Grand Orient of France granted the charter. To That's the right, to the, to the one in, in Italy, right? Yeah. So, so what, what, and, and then Napoleon put his stepson in as Grand Master of Italy. Now, for Napoleon to be in a position to appoint his stepson as Grand Master of Italy, by implication alone, Napoleon has to be the Grand Master of the Grand Orient of France. Because only the Grand Master of the Orient of France can appoint somebody to be Grand Master of another chartered lot. Well, let's let's go off on a little on a little segue here for a moment. Now, I think the the Zionists under Weishaupt they understood right away that there was already a power structure in in place that they could, if they were crafty enough, uh, usurp the influence of. 
by stealth, by by lying, by um, embezzlement or fraud or whatever they needed to do, or just by plain uh, um, numbers as they as they became larger and in population, these Zionists or many of them being crypto uh, Jews moved into positions of uh, importance within these lodges around the uh, 1760 period, if I'm not mistaken, at least in the United States. And they were singled out by some of the founders of the United States as being a danger to the freedoms of America. George Washington wrote about it. So did um, Jefferson. Both of them were involved in these lodges at some, and, at some level. But what they didn't know at the time was that there was already a move afoot uh, by Zionist um, elements, which were not called Zionist at the time, but Jewish elements, to usurp the um, the influence of these lodges and take over their uh, power. And this is why on the Internet, the reason I'm bringing this up is a lot of people blame the Masons for everything. They blame the the, uh, the Illuminati uh, for everything. And what, what I'm trying to point out right now is, yes, they are involved. Yes, they are big parts of this. But who formed these organizations and who took them over and who controlled them is more important, and is, there's a higher level of, there's a higher layer of, of control going on here, is there not? Well, Freemasonry and the lodges were a tool. That's that's the way to view it now, they're just a tool. At the time that you're mentioning, the, the, um, the late 18th century, Jews were able to enter into the lodges in, in the United States, that's correct. Yep. But in Europe, they had been the preserve of the royal and noble families your barons, your lords, your dukes, and, and they would meet in these kinds of places. So they, they by virtue of powerful people uh, uh, patronizing them, they had become institutions of power. And the, the Jews, because of their faith, they were, they, a lot of these lodges have rites, which are the practices, if you like, or the, the prayers or whatever we want to think of them as, the, the things that they actually do as worship, were Christian-oriented. And so the Jews had a great deal of difficulty getting into them. And in fact, in Germany, they weren't allowed ever, well, not for a long time into mainstream lodges. They had special Juden lodges, uh, Jewish lodges that they went into. And so the Jews for, for a long time were looking at these power structures within Europe externally and wanting to get in. And that's why they started pretending to be noblemen from other countries arriving in England or whatever. Um, and claiming to be the Duke of this country or that country. Isn't that well, how the, it's it interesting how the Rothschilds are, are barons and dukes and this and that. They they were from, uh, from a small uh, banking dynasty. They weren't royals in, in their uh, origins, but they, they ascended to royalty uh, by their own declarations. And you'll find that many, um, many royals in Britain today are of Jewish heritage, are they not? In the, uh, uh the first baron, French baron, actually was given his baronet um, by the uh, King of Austria, and it was due to monies that were owed by the King of Austria to them, and that what they did was they forgave part of the king's debt in return for a title that would impress people in France. This is uh, typical of the, the sort of social climbing that, that, that they were involved in because of uh, their standing as Jews in, in society. They, they did these kinds of things. But coming back now, in, in France, France was special, you know, because um, the first member of the Rothschild family that arrived in France, he really struck it off with the monarchy in France and, um, as a reason, and, and lent huge amounts of money which caused Gilbert and Sullivan to write in one of their famous operas that they were making monumental loans to foreign thrones. Um, that the the French, uh, the kings of France, just owed so much money to these people that they practically could do anything they wanted. And by the middle of the 19th century, we find that um, a man called Camus, a Jew from uh, Paris. Mm -hmm. um, managed to become the first Grand Master of a lodge in Europe who was Jewish. Um, and he, according to the uh, Encyclopedia Judaica, uh, he achieved that in 1869. Yeah. And he became the Grand Master of the Grand Orient 
of Paris, which basically put him in charge of all the French lodges and all the other Grand Orient lodges throughout Europe and all their subsidiaries. And of course, which one which had, uh, did exist at that time, he was technically the, the, the overlord um, even to the Italian lodges as a result, mm -hmm. like the Macedonia Resorta in Salonica. Yep. So a Jew, a Jew had actually, for the first time in history, had got into such an incredible position of power, but that was because of the debts owed by the royal family of France to the Rothschild family, and the fact that they developed great rapports that the Rothschilds would forgive debts and do favours for them in return for this kind of power. Mm. Now they used this newfound uh, strength in in their in their Masonic roots and their, their Masonic lodges, to, to, and they got had this diplomatic right going into the uh, turn of the uh, uh, from the 18th to the 9th. I mean, from the 19th to the 20th century, uh, when when things were hotting up for uh, for the uh, for the Caliph's uh, control, he was having problems throughout his um, throughout his uh, kingdom. I mean, he. He was putting out fires constantly uh, around the uh, the uh, Arab lands. The French were not only fighting um, uh, him in parts of Morocco where he had influence, in parts of Algeria where he had influence. In other words, there were little um, problems he was having everywhere. Were, were, were there not? Yes, I mean that that was um, one of the ways in which they defeated him. The, he was known as the grand the grand old spider uh, by the, the people who knew him. You know, he he had a web of intrigue everywhere. And the way that they actually took him on was by starting lots of small fires everywhere. He had them in the Balkans. He had them in Greece. He had them in Armenia. He had them in. Uh, uh, Arabia Felix, now known as Saudi, he had them in Syria. He so there was a, his, his empire was 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 feeling the death of a thousand cuts. That's right, and and this and all everybody was sort of trying to wear him down because, you know, they were aware. You, we had the Zionists coming in looking for their own agenda. In the meantime, the Armenians were sat on oil. There was a revolution going on in Russia, so they had their eyes on the Balkans. Everybody had nationalistic interests or monetary interests in, in getting rid of the guy, you know, and getting rid of his, his, his structure. So mm -hmm. they all had vested in and, and they just all attacked at the same time. Now, interesting, you wrote, but Mohammed, you wrote interesting something interesting about Jabotinsky, Tell us, tell us, well, tell us about what the research finds about Jabotinsky, uh, who, uh, if anybody's done any hi uh, history reading on uh, the Russian Revolution, um, uh, instrumental and in, uh, along with with um, with Trots Trotsky and others. But tell tell, tell them what, what his job was in this group. Well, one of the most um, uh, amazing things which proves that there is a link between the two sets of revolutions is the fact that Jabotinsky and Parvus, whose real name Alexander Israel Helphand, uh, both turned up, I think around 1910-ish, something like that, in Istanbul, employed by Carrasso directly, um, in, in two of, because Carrasso started uh, a couple of journals when they'd taken over, a newspaper and a journal, The Young Turk and the Turkish Homeland, and he employed J Jabotinsky and Parvus to act as editors um, in one form or another to these two um, uh, periodicals. And the, even the executive intelligence review writers, who are all Jews, by the way, mm -hmm. don't deny this. And we have to ask, what are these Bolsheviks doing in Turkey? You know, they're supposed to be, you know, communists through and through, totally against the idea of uh, uh, nationalism and they're trying to create a communist state without borders and getting rid of nationalist identity and here they are supporting a nationalist movement that's trying to create a single national identity uh, for, for uh, uh, people in, the, in this particular part of the world which was in direct opposition to the revolution which was going on north of the Black Sea. Well, then there's another uh, interesting thread um, bringing in uh, New York Jewry uh, into this. And we, of course, we know uh, about the money coming from the Schiff family of New York, the $20 million and the boatload of weapons and, and uh, 4,000 
uh, Brooklyn uh, Jews uh, uh, going over to Russia. Uh, but the Morgenthal was a money man at the time, uh, working uh, Rothschild's banks in the United States. And what happened with him you, you, is odd because he became the ambassador to Turkey. <laughs> Wait, Morgenthal Sr., exactly. Yeah. The, the, the interesting thing at this time was that he would have been preserving the banker's interests Yep. And at the time of the revolution, one of the things that's difficult to, to, that we must contextualize ourselves here is that Zionism was still in its influence, in inf, uh, infancy. It was an idea. It was a concept. The caliphate was still in charge of, of these lands. It wasn't until after the First World War that that changed. After the First World War, uh, Morgenthau had gone back to the United States. So he was there looking at things from a monetarist and business perspective, looking after the banking and business interests. He wasn't actually looking at a Zionist agenda. The Zionist agenda was being run by a part of the Rothschild family, and not all parts of the Rothschild family were in agreement with it, although they stumped the money up when, when it was requested of them. Not all of them agreed with the idea and thought, you know, let's buy the land or let's do this or that or the other. They didn't all agree with this. But Schiff said unequivocally that he'd put 20 on his deathbed, and it's a matter of public record that he spent 20 million dollars on the U.S. on the on the uh, USSR. But, but it's, it's it's astonishing that he has his financial fingers on, uh, and and Ben Friedman talks about Morgenthau's involvement along with Brandeis and the others. Uh, and and it, working on Wilson at the time, uh, and and so then it's odd that Wilson, uh, his administration would actually put Morgenthal in charge of the Turkish um, uh, ambassadorship. Uh, it, it, it's it's all it all comes together once you start looking at all these threads. It, it, it would have been more. Um, I think it, that, that Morgenthau would have batted in the other direction had he been there after the First World War and uh, after the Second World War, should we say, when, when the State of Israel was officially recognized. But not everybody was supporting the Zionist experiment, especially when they had nothing to show for it. Um, the fact that part of the Rothschild family put money up for a wild enterprise, really, I mean, if I came to you with that as a business plan, saying I'd like you to back me on the following thing, and, what, and you said, what's that? So I want you to finance me to knock down uh, Eric Schmidt's house, and I want to get back, you know, people who lived there three generations before or whatever, and, and, and come up with this wild idea. You'd say, you want me to throw good money into that? So you can see why some people wouldn't necessarily have, have, have supported it at that time. But obviously, as the decades have gone on, more and more people have come into line and put their shoulders to the wheel and come behind this 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 enterprise. You see. Well, what we what we do find is, as well going forward is that uh, the the young Turks um, did so did uh, organize themselves well enough to um, to de defeat the uh, the forces that, of the caliph and took over. Now, what we find now is. Uh, a lot of people in modern um, his, history, especially from, like, if you read the Executive Intelligence and many other um, uh, publications, they're going to push you away from the idea that, first of all, that the Young Turks were, were um, entirely a Sabbatean Jewish uh, group, but that they were solely and, 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 and principally responsible for the genocide of the Armenians. Now, there were... There were skirmishes again between the Turkish troops, but it didn't turn into a genocide until it was ordered by these forces, by the by the Young Turk forces. Another claim that they do make now is that um, that it's not a genocide because it wasn't premeditated. So they're saying one of the conditions uh, for calling something a genocide is that it was premeditated. Again, uh, Lauther, the ambassador to Britain, who was aware of some of the CUP, which was what they called themselves, or the Itihad movement, also the Young Turk movement, three names of the same, same group, that the CUP had, had said, we are going to use even massacres to enforce national identity on people. And that was in, at, the, at their meeting, I believe, in 1909 or 1910, two years before the massacres began. Mm. Mm. Now, 
what, what we get is is that after this after the massacres were were well underway, um, the rest of the world by this time was in, was engaged in World War uh, One, and so much of what was being done in in the uh, far off lands of Armenia were fell off the front pages of any Western um, publication. You might have found it on page twenty being mentioned in, in kind of a short note uh, two weeks after the event. But uh, the fact is that, that it wasn't getting much coverage until long after the dust settled and people s started realizing that an entire people had almost been completely uh, eliminated from, from our planet. Post-First post, post -first World War, the focus shifted, of course, to um, what was going to be done with Palestine. Right. And hence the Versailles Treaty and, and all, uh, you know, everybody, I mean, you couldn't get any other subject on the front page. This was what the big issue was. And, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution, it was so huge. You know, at the end of the First World War, we've got this change in, in, in the Middle East. We've got the Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah, sad, very sad for the Armenian peoples, but their plight was pushed onto the back pages, hardly noticed, and when pro um uh, Ottoman uh, Sultanate forces spoke out for them, which they did, and tried to say this was a young Turk pre-planned mass murder. They were just marginalized, sidelined, and sometimes even beheaded. Now, interesting, a, a parallel murder, genocide, I think, because it was pre-planned, was actually going on, um, on uh, at, at the hands of the Bolsheviks uh, in parallel. And it happened in the 1920s, um, it, when they when they moved south into the steppes, into the Ukraine area and into the Georgian region, and started wholesale slaughtering of Christians in that southern steppe region under the uh, under the Bolshevik control, and so basically what you've got is um, from from Turkey north into Armenia a murder of Christians, and from from uh, Moscow south uh, south uh, west uh, murdering of Christians. And in, in that whole region, what we're talking about, 25 to 30 million murders in a 15-year period. And, and, and we also find that some players that are architects of the murders in one side of the Black Sea, because this is basically going on on the north or south of the Black Sea. That's right. And is the Black Sea. And on the, on the north, we, we find that people who, who were born on, in one town, the same town, Odessa, uh, Jabotinsky, and Parvus, they were born in Odessa. They were involved in, in, in and both, again, uh, um, Ashkenazi Jews were involved in the revolution in the north and the mass murders in the north. And then they joined in the revolution in the south and the mass murders in the south. Uh, completely different uh, causes. It's so strange to see people with two, uh, p people join one cause and then another cause like this. It's just so strange. And but but the cause, the cause ends up murdering Christians in the millions, either through 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 direct uh, assault or starvation or other. Uh, but what what we see is that there was a plan to do this stuff in advance because they organized these uh, these killing fields um, and throughout that ten or fifteen year period, and it's the same people as you just mentioned behind both of these slaughters. And that means that whoever was giving them the orders in one uh, revolution was able to command them to go and join another one. As soldiers of fortune or soldiers of revolution, they had a single boss that managed to instruct them to leave one theater of war and join another one. And, we, and when they joined that second one, they become employees of Carrasso himself. Mm -hmm. and, and that brings us then to, you know, what the link is. Where, where does it go from there? Well, yep. we've shown that Carrasso's lodge, he could have only been appointed by the Grand Master of a lodge, which in turn was under the Grand Mastership of the Grand Orient of Paris. And we have to say that the Grand Master of Paris effectively appointed Carrasso into that position. And he and was Jewish. Can, yeah, and then we, we, we have one character, because... A lot of characters are fairly well known, um, but one, one character who isn't that well known, he probably was in his day, but now isn't that well known, was a chap called Mehmed Kavit. Yep. Um, Sabatian, um, Don May, um, beyond doubt, but strangely, 
um, according to uh, Professor Evram Erlek, um, also he was an ardent Zionist and saw the advantages for Turkey in the Jewish settlement of Palestine. Um, the, the fact that he was making um, this claim um, that, you know, it would be good for Jews to go to Palestine at the time of 1908-1909 is really interesting. Mm. And it becomes beyond interesting when we find out that in 1926 he fell foul for whatever reason with Ataturk. Ataturk was beginning to um, solidify and protect his power in Turkey. Yeah. And what he did was anybody who could potentially overthrow him, who had been colleagues of his um, and supporters during the revolutionary movement, he started to kill them off one by one by one. And in 19, 1926, Ataturk, I think, killed about 30 or 40 of the young Turk revolutionaries that he considered to be um, dangerous to him. And one of them was Mehmet Kavit. Mehmet Kavit had been found guilty, along with three other people, of an attempted uh, murder on Ataturk himself, an, an assassination attempt on Ataturk. And when he was found guilty and sentenced to death, something very strange happened. Uh, we find that uh, a, a very uh, famous French historian, uh, Alexandre uh, Zhivakov, uh, said that Kavit, uh, I quote, had connections with French financial circles, and both the French government and the House of Rothschild appealed to Ankara on his behalf. So Mehmed Kavit, to sum up, Mehmed Kavit, who was born in Salonika, Don May, member of the Young Turk movement, finds himself facing the death sentence, and all of a sudden, the French government and the House of Rothschild appealed to Ataturk to let him live. None of the other conspirators, just this one man. Yeah. How did they know of him? And why would it have mattered to them? Exactly. Why would it have mattered? How did they even know he existed? Why did it matter? Yet he was the only one who was actually a Zionist. So we've got a French, one man who's got a connection back to France that's considered so important in France that they've asked Ataturk to spare his life against an assassination attempt. And he had, he commanded that amount of clout with those people. So they knew who he was. There can be no doubt about that. And we, we, we have to say, well, okay, these people wanted to protect him because he was Zionist. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we, we then say, well, when we find that Rafik Bey, another one of the Young Turk movement, was actually in Paris in 1908, receiving money and support, we, 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 and, and we don't know who the other members of, of his delegation were, but several members of the delegation went to Paris, they were interviewed by the Tom newspaper, and I've given a reference for that, and, and we find then that at the other end, 18 years later, these people are actually asking Ataturk to spare his life. Um, well, you know, you pointed out something interesting in a private call, um, where, of course, throughout this, I mean, if you go to the Balfour documents, if you go to the financing of the settlement of Israel, if you go to the uh, people behind the um, Cavett's attempt to be spared, it always leads back to the Rothschild family. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the ball, the ball, the, the power stops, does it? Well, now we're not uh, we're not going to be able to put our finger on exactly who's holding the levers of power above that level, but there is there are indications that he takes some of his marching orders from somewhere else. Somebody sold the idea of Zionism to him, and sold him on the idea of financing it and and, and bringing the money, and he agreed to finance it. And he agreed to support it. And he actually uh, gave up his 
ordinary day-to-day banking activities to become a full-time philanthropist on behalf of the rest of the Rothschilds. And he, he went round raking money in and handing it out to the Zionist cause. So here is a man whose job it was to fund the Zionist cause. Part of the Zionist cause was the overthrow of the Caliphate. Yep. And we are not, we are supposed to then believe that he didn't give money to that cause, and yet he intervened in the matter of the execution of one of the few known Zionists involved in the cause. He, so he had direct links to people in the Young Turk movement who were actually on the Zionist agenda, and that those people were being financed in order to achieve that agenda. And when, when Ataturk wanted to get rid of him, they even asked, Please save him. Well, we know that the Rothschild banking fortune was the money uh, power behind um, Napoleon's rise to power a hundred years earlier. I mean, he was getting, he was drawing his loans for for, to, for his equipment and his forces and his his ships and whatnot to build the army that he went across Europe with, um, and, and he went to the bankers for that. And of course, the banker he went to was his own. Uh, his own uh, national um, power broker, and that and that was uh, the Rothschild banking fortune. Now, the same was true with Wellington's army and the British army was going to the um, the Rothschild, the Nathan Rothschild side of the family in London. There was um, an interesting situation um, going on at that time in which people were being played off against each other. And the only thing that people and the, the, there was one group left holding the money. Yes, no mm. doubt about that. So <laughs> one group left holding the money. <laughs> well, yeah, everybody owed the money. You know, but see, it, it, but mom, it, it. here's the interesting thing that that I find, and and that most even and this I brought up this guy uh, Abramson in the beginning. He he kind of this guy did. Um, Abramson talks a lot about the things we just discussed here. Not this particular subject, but a lot of these subjects. But he leaves out the importance of um, of Sabbatian uh, Zionist Jewish control of over all of these uh, criminal activities, generation after generation. Now, what he did do is he mentions that uh, that they were involved, but he doesn't mention that they are the leadership of it. And what we've been trying to do here on the French Connection is make those links clearer to the listening public as well as to find out if if there is in fact something even higher than um, the Rothschild family. And of course myself personally I believe you'll find some of those answers in the Lubavitch movement and uh, and you know you, to, to get into that is even more difficult but um, because that is a very secretive group when you find out who's actually running things over there, and those folks are actually claiming to have the new Messiah, the one that's going to build the Temple Mount in Israel and, and, and claim dominion over the world. Now, if one is to believe that these people are, are actually believing their own uh, their own dogma and their own hyperbole, then they're going to be, be uh, buying into the idea that one world government is going to come under the auspices of Noahide laws, run out of uh, Jerusalem with the banking structure that is a single banking structure worldwide, run by the banking arm of Rothschild, and uh, it, it has its tentacles in almost every um, corner of our globe, if not every. Am I correct in making those kinds of assumptions? I think that you're certainly going in the, in the right direction with that, Darrell. You know, I mean, what, what, coming back to the first part of what you said, it's very common for these people to affirm, yes, these events are going on, and then try to put a different controller on it, so that that way they assign the blame elsewhere and try to keep the guilt for themselves. They can't deny the facts are going on. And rather like I'm showing with these people who've rewritten history here and tried to change who Carousel was working for, in the same way you've got somebody going out there presenting a lot of the information that you've presented, but missing out three or four or five or six really critical pieces of the puzzle in understanding what's really going on. And they hope through that to sow confusion. And then they have other people who take, uh, take these differences to cause discord. 
so they want confusion and discord and pe- rather than people actually sitting down and trying to resolve this and agree that this is correct or that's correct what they want is confusion and discord and <clears throat> what we're trying to do like you say is present things clearly and say look you know there, there's some facts and there, here's the sources for it you know we, we're not making this stuff up this is what really happened well but you made another uh, interesting uh, Mohammed, you made another interesting uh, point to the Armenian community that we have um, powerful uh, documented evidence as well as some very uh, substantial circumstantial evidence that um, allows us to, to suppose the uh, Rothschild's involvement in the Armenian um, activities as well as the uh, Young Turk movement and the Salonika group and, um, and that, that if they were to take a, a page from the playbook of the uh, Zionist Jews, uh, they have a right to sue for reparations from the people who are responsible. Indeed, if, uh, if the Germans owe money to the Jewish community for the genocide perpetrated upon them, then surely the people who were behind the genocide in Armenia um, owe money to the descendants of the people who suffered. I mean, it seems to be, if all's fair, everybody should be entitled to the same claim, surely. Well, and that point, I, I think, shouldn't be missed by the, by the Armenians as a class action. But, I mean, when, when you take a look at, at the, the slaughter of the Jews, and there was a slaughter of the Jews, and many of them died from starvation in work camps, but it's always seemed to me in my research that, that many of the Jews died because they were not willing to be uh, participants in this uh, Palestinian experiment. They were cosmopolitan Jews in many cases, or they were Jews who didn't uh, want to, or they, their, their, their leadership didn't line up on the side of the Zionists uh, during the founding of this stuff, so they, they found themselves uh, running afoul of the Zionist movement and became uh, expendable and uh, found themselves in work camps and, and, and the like. And, uh, and so... It, it, it seems to me that, that this same group actually is willing to sacrifice their own. But when you say their own, you're assuming that these people are practicing the same kind of Judaism as many of the people in Northern uh, Europe were at that time. And what we found out is that the, Sab- the Sab- Sabbatian movement was not w- widely accepted as a, as a Jewish movement because of the bizarre kinds of practices that they adopted, and therefore... Uh, they had to hide the fact that they were Sabbat, uh, they were Sabbateans, because the Jews, the Jews of, that were righteous at the time, found that their their form of Judaism to be uh, an abomination. In, in, well, this is crucial actually, Daryl, because within the Jewish community, uh, the the Zoharites, the best way to identify the Sabbateans is also the Zoharites. The reason mm-hmm. for that being that there are three main works. People will try and quote loads of different ways of looking at the, the texts which the Jews have. But there are three main works that are the basis for beliefs. They're obviously the Torah, mainly in the books of the Old Testament to them. Um, there is the Talmud, the sayings of rabbis and various uh, legal scholars throughout time. And then there's the Zohar, which is a commentary on the Kabbalistic teachings within the Talmud. That's what these three books are, in a nutshell. And, and now the, the, the... What Zevi did was, the Sabbatai Zevi, he was very deeply into the Lurian Kabbalah practiced it big time and then when he had his David Shaler moment and suddenly discovered that he was the Messiah <laughs> discovered he was the Messiah one morning yeah. um, he told everybody hey I've come, I'm, I'm the Messiah and you're free of the books of the law of Moses we, we, you're not under the laws of Moses and you're not under the laws of the rabbis there's just one law forward from today forward and that's the Zohar and you only need this book. And they publicly, uh, both, both uh, Sebastian and Franks, uh, you know, the, the, the followers of them, they had burnings, public burnings of the Torah and the Talmud saying, we've been freed by God from these books, and now the Messiah has just given us, we just have to practice Kabbalah, and we're, we're, we're doing everything that's required of us, and we're free from the others. And, and obviously for Orthodox Jews, they were looking at this movement who hadn't accepted Zebra and said, what are you talking about? Who's he to cancel the books of God? 
you see. So this movement got rejected by orthodoxy. Didn't they try to go to Jerusalem before they went to the caliphate, um, uh, Sabbatai C, and he was yes. rejected by the by the, the principal rabbis of the Holy Land as as even being um, um, acceptable as a Jew, let alone as a as a uh, as a Messiah. Well, of course, back then the the, um, the ethnic divide was still quite hot, and those guys were Sephardic, and he was an Ashkenazi, so they wouldn't they weren't going to accept him just on that basis alone, let alone the fact that he was claiming that you know if they wait around till it gets icy outside, I can walk on water. It, you know, it is the the whole idea of what this man was representing is in their books. Like the Netaway card to say, we're waiting for the Messiah to come, and when he comes, he will lead us into the Holy Land, and the world will be full of peace, and the lion will lay da- down with the lamb, and it will all be lovely for everybody, and we'll hold hands and drink Coca-Cola or something. So the, the, the whole thing is that the belief in the Messiah was there, but he said, I am that man, and scrap these books. 300 years on, there, there, isn't, there hasn't been a real Messiah, and... They, his movement still accept him as Messiah, and so they don't accept these books. What they've had to do is pretend to accept them, you see, Daryl. So mm. they've gone out and said, oh, well, uh, I've just written a commentary on the uh, on the Talmud, so now I'm an authority on the Talmud, and, oh, by the way, have you seen the Zohar? Yeah? Oh, I'm an authority on the Torah. Uh, by the way, have you seen the Zohar? It's a great book. Have a look at this. They're trying to introduce people and get and push them and make them, they, they, they turn, make themselves look like orthodoxy, yet push them onto the Zohar, push them into their own beliefs, slowly hoping to pull them all in. Now, this has been done through, through the Shabbat or Shabbat Lubavitch. Uh, and the Lubavitch group started in the city of uh, Lubavitch, uh, in the uh, it's near Estonia and Latvia area in Russia, uh, and they uh, that's where many of your uh, the leadership of of this movement started out. And uh, of course now you'll find it um, in Brooklyn, New York has a big following, but they've built centers around the world, and almost every major city on earth has a Lubavitch uh, Lubavitch um, a religious center. And it is practicing these, uh, pushing these Noahide laws, which America has adopted, which European has, uh, nations have adopted. In fact, Noahide laws were in, integrated into much of the code of Napoleon at the time. So what you've got here is a, um, is a movement that has actually a lot of patience. It, it has its spiritual basis in uh, some rather bizarre practices and, uh, of course, uh, evil in order to get what you want, or what they call it, this teleological suspension of ethical principles, which means uh, the, the ends justifying the means, and it's all under God, in their view. Well, from, for, for the Zoharites, one of the teachings of Zevi, under the Lurian Kabbalah, what the Lurian Kabbalah brought, which the previous Kabbalah didn't have, was the left hand of God. Yeah. And it say, what it says is that all works are righteous. So, and it's, and it's actually worse than Talmudism. It's worse than the things in the Talmud. Well, this is why I'm trying to differentiate it with people, and I, I was trying to do this with Wake Up From Your Slumber and some of the people there. I'm trying to explain to them. A Zoharite is worse than a Talmudist. Although the Talmud is very offensive in respect of, say, Jesus and the Christians, uh, the peace be upon him, well, it's, it's very unpleasant in that area. This stuff is just way off, is way off the radar. It, it says, you can just do anything as long as you're undertaking the work of the left hand of God. You can rape a woman and it, you're fine. It's not a problem because you're saying this is that God created good and God created evil and I'm enacting the evil that God has created under his left hand. So he gives them carte blanche to absolutely do anything. Worse than the Yom Kippur prayer that says, absolve me of all my sins in the year to come, at least there they're admitting they're committing sins. In this one, there are no sins. Mm. Now, in the Zorites, there's no sin. They do have a hand signal, do they not? And isn't it the, the, the index finger and the baby finger pointed up? And that is a Lorian hand signal, is it not? There are reasons why they they would use those kinds of signals. Uh, they've got several um, un- underground things. There are some people who even say that's an Illuminati signal and, and lots of claims about it. The, the important thing is 
that they are trying to win over the Orthodox and the Reform and the liberal Jewish communities by pretending to adhere to these other books. And, the, and, the, and the, the strange thing is most of the Jews don't know this, and only the Netare Carter are the ones who are standing there and saying, these people are doing the work of Satan. Yeah. You know, they, that's what they actually say. They say, these people are Satanists. They don't believe in God, and they, they don't believe in Torah, and they don't believe in the Ten Commandments, and they don't believe in the laws of Moses. They don't believe in these things, and Jews are supposed to believe in these things. And, and also, the, they, although they accept the Talmud, the thing about the Netare Carta is that they don't believe in the elements of, of uh, Talmud which say that Gentiles are uh, non-human. They actually say all of mankind will live in peace together under the Messiah, and that everybody is a human being, and that under the Messiah, they will, he will redeem everybody. This is a very generous sort of uh, uh, world view. Once you get beyond that, absolutely, they say they're only half animal and this, that, and the other, and th those, are Tal th those are Talmudists. But on the far end of orthodoxy, they won't look at the, the, to the Talmud unless they absolutely have to. They'll say, if I can find what I need in the Torah and the laws of Moses, that's sufficient. And those books said, my neighbor is any human being. And, and according to that understanding, I'm not allowed to hurt anybody. When we look in the Talmud and see what a neighbor is, it says, oh, it's only Jews, ignore the Gentiles, they're not our neighbors. Mm. But, they, but they don't take that interpretation. Not now, you said something to me very interesting about, about Alistair Crowley. And about about Albert Pike and about and about the movement of this, um, the, the, they were kind of an advance guard in the United States, moving um, the the mindset of America into an evil kind of mindset. And if you take a look at the uh, forces behind pornography and, and child sex slavery, and uh, and the uh, the homosexual uh, child uh, sicknesses that have gone on in Washington D.C. and in Britain, in your government. Uh, and around the world, behind that you find um, elements within the Jewish community, but they are elements within this um, this Zohar, Zoharist Sabbatian uh, Jewish element. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. You, anybody who's pushing the Kabbalah, which the Freemasons do, because the rites which are practiced in Freemasonic lodges are all Kabbalistic rites. That's one of the big tricks that's being played on people. You know, the, as the Jews moved in and took over and brought in different types of rites and put different rites in places, they, they became uh, uh, Kabbalistic rites. So the York rite stuff, which is practiced in England, uh, is completely Christian in, in, in character. When we look at the Scottish rite and the Orient rites that go to 33 degrees, the 33 is actually a number pulled out from the number of links between the Sephiroth on the Tree of Life in the Kabbalah. And that it actually, each right represents a movement up in the Kabbalah. And, and these people are practicing this stuff, thinking it's Freemasonry, not realizing they're practicing Kabbalah. Now, this, the idea yeah, of leadership in this group of uh, Lubavitchers, uh, uh, they have what they call ball shams, do they not? And could you explain to the listener what a ball sham is? Well, a ball sham is um, somebody who seems to have paranormal um, powers. Um, we had um, the Baal Shem of, um, in, the, in London um, who came over and, and absolutely wowed local society by, uh, according to what the history books say, I don't know how true it is, being able to summon clouds and cause lightning and, and do all sorts of magical stunts, basically, and magical tricks. Whether these guys are, you know, um, prestigitators or hypnotists uh, or yeah as, as they like to call themselves a conjurer, whether they were conjurers or whether this stuff is real is, is a different matter the point is that people witnessed these uh, these people doing these things and believed in them and the Baal Shem movement um, which is a, a separate movement within the uh, Zoharites so they're, they're, they're the adepts of the, of, of the Zohar in theory these are great Kabbalistic practitioners who really got to the top and the Baal, Baal Shem was one of the founders of the whole Lubavitch movement and when you realize that 
that Baal Shem started that movement, you realize that, you know, hold on a minute, this isn't founded in, in the Old Testament teachings, which tell us to stay away from this kind of stuff. Um, it's going in totally the opposite direction. Well, you know what, Mohammed? When we take a look at, at, at all of the facts we just uh, sh um, shared with the, the listening public, not all of them were in your article. What we stuck to in the article was uh, talking about links between European Freemasonry, uh, the, the links to the Jewish community within Masonry, and the um, the Young Turk movement, and then of course the subsequent uh, slaughter and uh, and uh, complete annihilation of the uh, cohesive Armenian community. Um, but there's more to this story, and that's why I, I continued on with this discussion because there, I wanted people to have the uh, the surrounding uh, kind of knowledge so that they could maybe um, go further. And, and we'll, we will do more for them as well, but they can, you know, knowledge is available out there to anybody who wants to work hard enough to uncover it. And, and the fact that you've been able to uncover many of these facts uh, points to the idea that, 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 that it's available to everyone. So I, I wanted everybody to get maybe a few extra ideas uh, from this file and be able to carry the ball even further on their own, and we're going to do the same, I hope, uh, together. I certainly hope so, Darrell, and I hope that we can uh, continue on, as you say, with, with looking at some of the other important dimensions to this, because we need to try and uncover. Uh, ultimately, what we're looking for is uh, who is the hand behind this, who is controlling the secret services, the intelligence agencies of the world, who is, you know, because that's just another tool. The, the, the Freemasonic lodges, they're just another tool. The Illuminati, the CFR, the Bilderbergers, these are just different faces but of who? There's somebody behind these masks, and we need to try and find out who that is. Well, I, I, I have, I have a first, first uh, 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 indication that, that Rothschild is at least the, the, the top or close to the top man, but certainly there are others, uh, principles in this that have a billing with him uh, that, that are certainly... Um, geopolitical billing as, as very high up, uh, and, and then there's a spiritual element that we haven't completely uncovered. But uh, to say that it's just Rothschild would be uh, shorting the uh, the actual facts, and so we don't want to stop there. Absolutely not. That 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 would be wrong, and it would be easy to point to somebody who died 50 or 60 years ago and say, "Oh, it was all his fault. Let's walk away from it." And there hasn't been a continuation since then. Um, the whole point is that the, the Rothschild, which I name in that document, uh, unequivocally has long since left this world, but it doesn't mean to say that the people who instigated him to support the operation uh, are, have left the world, and it doesn't mean to say that the belief system that they follow um, has, has in fact changed in any way either. Well, I want to thank you again, Mohammed. This was an extremely important uh, bit of research that you've done today. And uh, going through this uh, information with you has been a very, uh, very enlightening, and I appreciate your time with us, as always. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Mohammed Rafik, uh, great, great researcher, a uh, wonderful guy to, to uh, take seriously when he speaks. Uh, and uh, we will have him back to continue our research. But uh, until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, I, I urge each and every one of you to um, dub redouble your efforts at getting this information out. The Armenian community, I think, should uh, check on everything we've talked about tonight, everything. Uh, we have not uh, brought anything to the table today that you can't discover on your own. And uh, and then take it from there, because uh, you, you do deserve justice. Uh, the American people are facing uh, the most awful calamity, I think, uh, in, in modern history. And... Uh, and I can, the only thing I can think of that parallels it is the is the uh, implosion of the, of Russia and the murder of its 50, 60 million people over a over an 87 year period under at the hands of this group. And I think America is uh, poised to have a similar experience. And uh, because of that, it's dire that you uh, get um, to do your own due diligence and bring these facts to as many people as possible. But until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Daryl Bradford Smith saying. Be well. Bye-bye now. Um, mirrors the work we uh, put out on our audio files and in our written work and Bolin's work and others that we've had on the French Connection for about two years now. 
Uh, he does a very complete job of presenting it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, you might want to ask yourself uh, um, who had it first, and, and not this isn't a, a, a one-upsman game here, but rather that where were um, the, the Jack Bloods of the world, who actually were at this conference where he did this presentation, uh, when they were bad-mouthing us for our efforts uh, exposing the Zionist criminals. They were telling everybody that we were no good, we were liars, and now all of a sudden they've come to see the light. Well, what we've come to understand is that the real game they're trying to play here is take control of the message. And uh, we'll go into that in another file, but I just wanted to point it out that they are attempting again to take control of the message. This is no different than what uh, Mr. Berkness has done. Um, he did early files with us, and now he's claiming that the research we've got is, uh, is from his research, which certainly it is not. And we have actually found things out that he will not touch, has not discussed. And again, he's trying to carry the message to the Armenian community so that the criminals themselves are presenting the work rather than the, the uh, actual researchers. But I'm going to bring up my guest right now. Uh, Mohammed, are you with me? I am indeed. Good evening, Daryl. Nice to have you back, Mohammed. You know, uh, as always, we are, we're just we're trying to move the ball down the field. And you made a, a, an, an interesting observation that uh, the French connection has always been uh, out at the head of the tip of the spear, as it were, with uh, with our research and the things that we've discovered. <clears throat> and and it's oftentimes the people that are doing their own uh, catch up are are actually the bad guys trying to usurp our. Uh, position in leadership here as researchers. Um, so they've got a three-pronged approach to trying to destroy the French connection. First, uh, assail our character and us personally, and then you, you know, empire began to grow. Now, what you point out in the piece is that there were um, there was friction between the Armenian community that was being uh, actually fomented and, and exacerbated by the British, American, and other governments, German governments. Uh, in order, was it German? You said I can't remember the in, inside the piece, but there were pe there were groups out there trying to uh, have the Armenians rise up a little bit uh, for independence or more recognition within the Ottoman Empire, and the, this um, kind of led the, the caliph, I would imagine, to suspect them which was his downfall because the people that were telling them to suspect the, uh, the uh, Armenians for this were actually the ones that ultimately took him over. I think that the, the side scraps that were going on with the Armenians and the, uh, the caliph uh, weren't major issues. They were internal domestics. They were seen by the British and the Germans and the Russians as an attempt to make friends in the area with par parties that were hostile to the leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was purely for international political purposes um, that they all saw that in the event that um, changes would happen in the government or that if the Armenians succeeded in getting devolution to some degree and autonomy, that they would have been allies at that stage and would have had influence in the area. And, right. of course, the Armenians were sat on the back of oil fields at that time. Yep. Uh, so th th there were political reasons there. Um, and, and what we have going in the opposite direction, as I point out in the piece, are, are this young Turk movement who want to actually divest everybody of, divest the, the sultanate of the other Muslim lands and just focus on those which are Turkic. Mm -hmm. But but they included usurp our our uh, leadership as uh, researchers, and then finally um, to ignore us. And those are the three ways that they have uh, tried to get rid of our message. Uh, I don't think it's working. What do you think? Well, I think that um, from the figures which you're quoting, Daryl, it seems like more and more people are tuning in to your shows, and more and more people are looking at the. Uh, pages which you're putting on your site, and, and the whole thing is growing. So it is. On, on that on that basis alone, factually, they're, they're failing. Yeah, I agree. And well, what, what we've got with your, your present presentation here on this uh, on this Young Turk movement, you want to get us started on on a couple of the, the points. In fact, it, there's going to be the accompaniment accompanying um, article that you wrote. On the uh, on the file with this, but I'd like to discuss some of the the uh, nuances of your research. We, we want to start us off with this movement and possibly how it got its uh, its beginnings. 
Sure. I mean, we, we had a, a bit of a discussion the other day, didn't we, Daryl, on, on yeah. this subject where we touched it a bit. And I felt a little bit guilty at the end of it about not really filling in details and giving um, the listeners to your show uh, hard and fast researchable facts, which is what we're used to giving people. So um, I, I went out and put something together from the books which I normally have that I would use as my sources, and I've looked to see what kind of information was available on the Internet so that it's there for referral purposes. Because, as you said in the previous show, maybe for somebody listening to this for the first time, it's, it's too fantastic. It's just, oh, th th this can't possibly be the case. Hmm. So what, we, what we're trying to do, th 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 to, just to set the background for everybody, I'm, I'm trying to use um, authorized, orthodox historians and biographers who talk very coldly, and, and as you've, you've read the piece already, Daryl, I'm yeah. also quoting people like the British ambassador to Constantinople, the U.S. ambassador, and, and other similar kinds of figures from, from uh, declassified and publicly available uh, government documents. And, and of course, uh, Mr. Gray himself, the, 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 the foreign secretary at the time. Uh, in the Foreign Office of the British Government. So, very well-known people. The reason for that is that the people like the ADL at the moment who are trying to not recognize the genocide as, as one of uh, history's many rewrites, there's a group of people out there on the net who are publishing their version of history Mm -hmm. which has got some of the, the, the important facts. They admit quite a few elements, and then they try and take people off down the garden path this way or that way to try and put, make, make it look like the, the real uh, protagonists were somebody else. That's you right. Know? So this is, this is the, the, the nature of the activity, because what we've been trying to do, the work that you've been doing, that I've been trying to support you with, it is to show people that it's the same group that have marched down the centuries that have been up to this. Yeah. And so what they have to do is make it look like it's been different groups throughout the centuries in, involved in these activities. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this allegation is unfounded. That's right. Well, I, I, the interesting thing that, that I've discovered that, that in, from your research as well as and, and I have to admit some of the research from other people who are trying to marginalize us as leaders in this uh, fight uh, do point out that, uh, that Sabatai C has a very important role to play in the relationship that the Ottoman Turks had uh, with the uh, young Turks and, and how the uh, crypto-Jewish um, uh, movement within the, uh, the caliphs um, uh, cold air Rushes like bullets through my brain Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the French Connections Friday Night Edition. Today's date is August 24th, 2007. It's actually on the cusp of being August 25th, ladies and gentlemen. We're four minutes to midnight here in, in central France. And we have put together an article with the help of and the, uh, and the research of uh, Mohammed Rafik. Mohammed has been uh, a, a frequent guest on the French Connection, so many of you are well aware of Mohammed's work. Uh, there are people uh, that have tried to assail our efforts in many areas that Mohammed has talked about. But his confirmations uh, generally come from, uh, from very reliable sources, uh, very different sources. In fact, he uses archives, he uses internet, he uses um, historical documents, he uses all kinds of different sourcing uh, to verify the things that he uh, presents. And that there is no exception to tonight's presentation on um, the foundations of um, the Young Turk movement and how it was orchestrated through a uh, the Italian lodge structure, Masonic lodges, which were infiltrated um, in the century prior to the Turkish um, Young Turk Revolution in, in, in the Ottoman Empire a downfall, and how these uh, these these lodges were used as instruments to undermine the control of uh, of the, the Turkish government of the uh, Ottoman uh, Turk government and institute a new government under Ataturk. Now, I'm going to uh, bring up my 
um, my guest in one moment, but I want to make um, a statement about uh, Daniel Abramson's uh, presentation. Um, you will find that uh, it is a, a very well uh, orchestrated presentation. It is uh, in almost every way 